everything is supreme bliss equal to space itself, the expanse of Dharmakaya. There is nothing that is not free within the expanse of Dharmakaya. The true nature of everything is experienced intuitively as the kaya of the Vajra heart essence. The dynamic energy of this heart essence is perfect within the body born of habitual patterns. Once the body of conditioned existence between birth and death is cast off, awareness is experienced as a oneness, in no way divisible. Once one has gained the empire on the level of spontaneous presence, emanations occur without restriction, and one can engage in every situation without impediment, such as the domain of a yogin who is effortlessly born on the wind. While this is unacceptable to anyone involved in lower spiritual approaches, it is shown by the Ati approach to make perfect sense. It is the key point of the fruition. Opening up a new section in the precious treasury of the basic space of phenomena, Long Chen Rob John. And I know there are some words in there that required explanation. And there's so much in it, such as Dharmakaya, of Vajra, Vajra heart essence, heart essence, the difference between that and another term. Several other things in here, which really is a whole system of teaching. So I'm pardon if that one is coming in a little bit over, over the top for some people at this time. I am reading through this entire book from start to finish. It is beneficial to hear these teachings, even if you have no idea what they mean. You can just start at the beginning, have an inhale, exhale. Just linger there in empty space and let your awareness be fresh as the morning dew. Softly in a morning sunrise. Okay, never mind. I'm not going to go into explaining all that stuff because that's not my role, but you can find the teachers who explain this kind of stuff. Kind of stuff I want to talk about today on episode 108. And I know 108 is a mystical number. I, I know it was popular in the, oh, I don't know if it was the Dharma punks early. And kind of the Hindu. I don't know 108 is a sacred number. People tattoo it and, and things like this. At any rate, it is considered auspicious, but really the point of the 108, is, as I was told by my Tibetan Buddhist uh, nun friend, is that in case you make a mistake and you're doing 100 mantras, you're probably going to make a mistake in 108. But it, I'm sure it has more significance than that. But that's all the airtime I'm going to give it. What I want to talk about, psychedelic sobriety, is the use of psychedelics a relapse in recovery? What is the nature of of our relationship to psychedelics. As people in recovery, we've probably abused them at one time or another. Now, some people have taken mass overdoses and lost total control. So why would anyone in recovery consider the use, medicinal or otherwise, of something that seems pretty risky? Well, it's okay. I'm here to tell you, you can, and it'll be okay. It'll be all right. We'll talk about it. We'll get you through the night. Well, this is a big story. It's no longer a new story. It was a new story when I broke it in the 12-step Buddhist 10-year anniversary edition in 2018, and then it became a super powered. But, you know, having been in, in different parts of the country, I have noticed that, well, I was in a kind of a, a funnel, a tunnel, a vacuum, uh, a Shangri-La, an oasis of spiritual wisdom, in the places where I lived, and particularly just on the West Coast in general, but in California, where I spent most of my life, Northern California, San Jose area, Bay Area, Southern California, Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach, Huntington Beach for a while, San Diego for quite a few years, and Oregon, Portland, Oregon for 13 years. So I've been in places, Santa Cruz for five years. I've been in these spiritual wisdom kind of places where there's an intersection of a lot of different things, different teachers, different people come through. You get a lot of eclectic ideas and so forth. And when you're in that kind of a funnel, you don't really realize how far away from that level, let's say in spiral dynamics of going from 
green, you know, or even going to green, elevating up from the materialistic into the more ecological kind of community, you know, mentality, the, the generous, the, the nonprofit, that type of mentality up into, you know, moving into higher levels. It, it, you can look at Ken Wilber and Don Beck for things like that, but you're really just kind of looking at the progression of cities as I've seen in just in my, you know, narrow view, I suppose, of, you know, what it, what it's like to be in a cool town and all the interviews that I've done of people over the years of where they live and, and thousands of people that I met in my Uber. So, you know, I've been trying to think about this for quite some time. It really has been evolving. There's a lot more yoga, a lot more little, you know, uh, cubby uh, walking neighborhoods and, you know, so forth. But there is also... It's a real shock. You can you can be walking down the street in Portland and say to the person, "Hey, how you doing? Oh, pretty good. My UFO was over last night." And you'd be like, "Oh yeah, mine was on Tuesday." It's really not unusual, and people are dead serious, but not so crazy. I mean, I knew a girl that I really like. I still like her, and she went off to the UFO people like up in up in Washington for like two years or something. All they did is wait for the UFOs. The point is that when you get to other places, people don't think like this. And I've had all these people contact me over the years, and I'm really sorry to everyone who they've said, well, I'm in Indiana, I'm here, I'm there, I'm in South Carolina, I'm far away from anything or anyone who has any kind of anything, I'm in Missouri, this and that, and spirituality, Buddhism, like-minded people are few and far between. I Now I have so much more empathy for you, having been in that similar situation now, and been a fish out of, spiritual fish out of water flopping around on the deck, flopping. So Eddie Murphy reference there for those not in the know on that reference. So what do we mean by psychedelic sobriety? How, isn't that an oxymoron? Doesn't that, Larry, isn't that like saying heroin sobriety? Well, the whole point of this, the beginning of this and this work that I'm doing and I've been researching for uh, five years, five plus years, it really does coincide and overlap with the concepts and principles in compassionate recovery, which you should get today. It would be really cool if you call your local independent bookseller or go in there and say, here's the money, order me that book, put it on your shelf. That would be helpful. And that gets it in the system. Hey, buy a copy, donate it to your library. Buy copies of the 12 step Buddhist and compassionate recovery, donate them to treatment centers, to libraries. To, no, treatment centers are a really good one. I do it, you guys. It's my book, and I send them out, okay? I send, I send them out two or three, three, five a month, six, seven, eight a month. It just depends if there's any money, right? So it's a good thing. It's a very good karma. It's a very good, positive, health, healthy, helpful thing. Yes, bring other books as well. Send them to prisons, people. Buy these books and send them to prisons. Bring them to prisoners. Bring them to inmates. If you're taking an AA meeting into the jail, bring them a copy of Compassionate Recovery, please. The 12 Step Buddhist is important, but the Compassionate Recovery sets the groundwork for the rest of the work because we have to understand where it comes from, what to do about it, so we can understand how, to, how, the, how what we're doing applies when we do a practice. We really want to know, hey, I'm doing mindfulness all the stuff going on in my body and brain and, and Buddhism and, and Tibetan, as we say, body, speech, and mind, body, energy, and mind, you know, and all these things that are going on under the surface and under the hood and things I thought I had no control over, things I blamed others for, things that, yes, I can, yes, it's true, I don't have as much control over it, and it, it is the cause of others in the past, but not the present circumstances. Poor people who have suffered the brunt of that you know, really bringing it forward, you know, snapping it like a, like a, like a wing chun, you know, like a rock on the end of a leather rope. Thwack, pow, biff. You know, so sobriety hits us like that, right? It hits us like a rock. If we're going to come to terms with life on life's terms, as we spoke about in last week's show, check that one out at podcast.compassionaterecovery.us because it's not about me. It's about us. We cannot do it alone. So setting the groundwork of understanding ACEs, understanding that psychedelic research, everybody's pretty aware of it now, but I mean, I've been studying it pretty deeply for quite a few years now. Yeah, I'm really aware of how widespread it is, but it might not be that widespread to you, depending on where you are. If you're in another country, it's certainly not as widespread. And we do get listeners 
Hello, listeners out there. We've got listeners all over. Bless you, and good luck to your sobriety. Let me give you a little little thing I love from St. Teresa of Avila. Let's have this as a meditation. Inhale. Exhale. Release. The time has come to love more and think less. Sit in a deep quiet in which love is translating you into God. Consider that for just a moment. Write it down. Go to the notes on the podcast website there that I just gave you. The time has come to love more and think less. Sit in a deep quiet in which love is translating you into God. Wow. We really do need to ground ourselves with mindfulness, and we do need to understand something of the wiring of our systems and the the resultant complexities such as addictions, hypertension, depression, suicide, complex PTSD, you know, not just event PTSD, not to minimize that at all, but long-term acute, ongoing condition of not being able to escape, being trapped, creates the fire alarm that just never stops going off. I'm 61, it's still going. Maybe it's not for you. Blessings, I'm glad. For many of us, it is. I keep meeting them. So no, we're, we're not alone in this at all. There's quite a few of us. I just spoke with someone last night. Most people who have high ACEs are dysregulated. So what are we going to do with psychedelics? We're not, well, I'll tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to have the same relationship. And I'm not really talking about anything in specific, but let's say something relatively organic and safe, like a little tiny bit of psilocybin. I've heard of people having a little tiny, tiny bit of psilocybin. Uh, Reportedly, something like a a, a ground up in a a coffee grinder and a little tiny one thirty second of a teaspoon mixed with ashwagandha is really fantastic. A girl gave me some, really recommended it to me, one of my uh, super hot yoga teachers there in San Diego. I have social anxiety. You should try ashwagandha. Well, you know, if the psilocybin gave you a little bit of anxiety, wouldn't the ashwagandha be nice to have right there? And it's such a tiny amount of psilocybin. How could it really trip your trigger? Well, listen, think about it first. If you're going to have a microdose, think about a lot of things first. Don't have a macrodose if you're in recovery. Please don't have a macrodose of anything if you are in recovery. And I'm, I'm, I'm cautioning people right now, because this is the next phase of my work, to share with you ongoing work, publications, etc. Please don't take a macro. You're not a hero if you over, if you're not a hero if you have a, 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 an acute PTSD trigger. And if you take too much of something and you have to have a lot of understanding, I think, and you, or you should at least have a little understanding. So I'm working up a traveler's guide for you so you can have a little understanding and, and, and it'll take anyone through it. And we can go deeper into lots of things, but the basis and the basics of this, the answer to the question that I have, I consider myself clean and sober in recovery. It'll be 26 years, December 4th. Yet... I believe that it is okay to change one's relationship with, say, a simple psychedelic. All right? Fill in the blank, but please don't fill it in with something scary and dangerous and overpowering. Okay? Be really safe. Be really careful. Be really mindful. Have support. Don't do it in in a random way. First, I'm going to invite you to try doing, and I have this, I don't have this 100% worked out yet. The idea is to write down an inventory of what's called a PPP. So grab a pencil and a piece of paper if you want to write this down or you can come back to the show later on Spotify, YouTube, all kinds of places like that. And just write it down, PPP, personal, psychedelic profile. And you can just write down all of the instances that you can think of are the most monumental ones that you've had with any kind of psychedelic throughout your life. And, um, you know, in the next column, you can say, was well, it a was it a good experience? Was it was it helpful? Or was it anything? Was it just part of addiction? Was it partying? Were there insights? Were there questions? Were there experiences? Were there deepened relationships? Was there anything mystical that happened? And we're going to go into depth on all these. So there's a lot. We can't talk about it in one show. I mean, it's going to be a several shows as we go 
as I work this up here before the Christmas break, hopefully, or not the Christmas break, for the, for the holiday season here. Don't have a lot of time. So trying to get it to you. And the number one thing, just write them all down, the experiences that you have, that you've had. And then, you know, pull out the parts that are not in the addiction realm, the parts that are in the, maybe the spiritual realm, the the more mysterious or mystifying. You know, when shit gets mystifying, we got to get mystical. That's what's up. And, you know, what is mystical? Here's a meditation from James Finley on the video on YouTube, Mystical Sobriety, of what he says is mystical. What we're powerless to attain. You see, that thing we want, that thing where that peace, where that ease, that, that, that not suffering that we're trying to get, that, that, let's just call it that not suffering that we're trying to get. The thing that we're powerless to attain, and here it's our higher power, is attaining us. What we're powerless to attain is attaining us in our inability to attain it. Here's the practice. Inhale, breathing in God, right deep into the unresolved questions. Inhale. Exhale, surrender, and give all. Abandon yourself completely to God as you understand God. No, we didn't get religious on you. It is the 12-Step Buddhist podcast, but there are a lot of reasons why there's intersections here between mystical and spiritual practices and tools, such as what we do here. Everything I do on this show is conscious. It's not just random. So we're working this all up into the idea of what would we like our relationship to be? If you think about it, if there were no positive experiences in your psychedelic profile, I don't recommend that you get into it without help of a clinician or a clinical trial, something like that. And you can get it in places like Oregon. They're actually allowing people that have no insurance and stuff to get psychedelic treatment there. But like I said, they're not doing that in, in BFE, okay? They're not doing that in most places. I mean, you can still, if you ever watch the To Catch a Smuggler show, on National Geographic channel there. I mean, they're, they will, they arrest, they don't really want to arrest you really, but they, they, it's a federal crime to take cannabis there. And, and, you know, someone had, someone had admitted that they smoked cannabis and had, they looked through his phone and, and they forbid him or they flagged him for any time he comes to the country. Again, he's got to go through secondary and they're going to be up his butt every time for cannabis. So you can't just say, oh, because it's cool here. I mean, you have to understand it's the whole world, actually. You can still be imprisoned in a lot of places. So just because we're coming up and coming along and not everybody is, psychedelics is no exception. It's really even more crucial. So it's not a party substance and you're not trying to be a party animal. You want to have a basis of self-compassion, a basis of mindfulness. I think a groundedness in the Four Noble Truths, the, the meditations of compassion and equanimity. And you want to be able to sit and sit still and be able to have a relaxing, a comfortable life because the microdose experience is not something that you really might notice right away. If you do something like that, one thirty second or one sixteenth of a ground up, allegedly this causes the uh, very smooth transition into some more mystical, a more creative, more open minded, heart centered, more clarity. You know, the thinking. If you have a little bit of a microdose and a little bit of the with the ashwagandha or some CBD and your your fitness is good, your breathing is good, you know how to do a little yoga, you know, you're you're grounded in your recovery, you've got some time clean and sober, you have worked the steps. I would never do any of this without that basis. And for me, it didn't even begin without that basis. For, I don't know, 30 plus years of experience, but I was in my <clears throat> 17th year of sobriety. Uh, so we'll talk more about that in depth later. The idea that I'm just putting out there for you is just start to consider what your relationship was and what you'd like it to be. And then consider a very, very safe, very organic and very regulated with notes, with intentions set before you know, you're not having an experience. You're just having a day. If you had a microdose like that, you'd do your whole day and you wouldn't notice. But if you did it, you know, every third day or once a week, or if you did it and had a continued ongoing yoga and or meditation and or breathing and or somatic and or, you know, deeply hypnotics, you know, psycho-spiritual, whatever kind of things, just a real good deep practice, a shamanic practice. You want to be grounded, you guys, particularly those of us for whom the psychedelic 
medicine is said in the research now, and people are reporting that it is very beneficial for the kind of stuff we have, complex PTSD. For example, anxiety, panic, all this kind of stuff, depression, all this kind of stuff, right? But those of us people who have those things, if you've read Compassionate Recovery or read The Body Keeps the Score, and you'll understand what's going on there. So we wanted to, you know, we do want to be careful. And, and we're not trying to have an experience. Oh, I had my microdose. I'm going to, no, just have it in the morning if you're doing it. Don't be uh, like it's a big event. It's very, very, it's part, you have to work it into your, let it work you into you. Work with it into your day, into your path, into your mindful steps, into your 12 steps. Yeah, you can go on a retreat and so on and so forth. But like I said, it's really not advisable to go too far over. It's really advisable to think long and hard and to consult others and have a plan and have an integration plan for after. Say you're going to say you're going to microdose once a week for a month or you're going to do it once a month for six months or once every three days. I wouldn't do it every day. We'll do it once every three days for, for a week or for two weeks. So however you're going to do it, write it down. Make notes. What's your intention? Did you notice anything different? Okay, how can you how can you notice more and put less effort into it? How can you use the, the tool of the psychedelic experience into your meditation practice such that you build yourself a stable platform upon which you can come up like a fish out of water, flapping around on the deck, you can slop your way up somehow to a place of groundedness. Have an inhale. Find your ground. Let it go. Exhale. <sighs> Jump back. Hi! 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 Who's meditating here? Who is the meditator? Well, if you're microdose and you're doing this kind of meditation and practice, you can get some more, you know, interesting insights and understanding and wisdom. You can follow sacred teachings and sacred masters and really incorporate this. So that's all I'm going to talk about for the moment. We're going to get down, get into it. I'm going to be going forward, going through this, keeping in mind everything that I've written and said up to this point. It's all progressing through the Compassionate Recovery Guide series. I'll talk to you more about it again. You can go to the donation page at podcast.compassionaterecovery.us. Support the show. Support my work. Still need your support. Giving you my all. You're going to get more of it next week, y'all. Until then, peace out and namaste. Namaste.